<laughs> it says live. Hi, everybody. This is Arnold Manjoli for Grateful, Ready, Open, Willing. And uh, I'm here with my wonderful associate, Lindsay Bristol, whom you all know um, makes me better. She makes us all better. Uh, and we are here tonight to spend some time with a, a, a Broadway hero, uh, Jeff Whiting. Um, I'm sure many of you know Jeff um, uh, by name as the uh, founder, I guess, and head of Open Jar Institute and also the Open Jar Studios, which we were so excited to have a new studio space in Manhattan for auditions and rehearsals. And it opened up and everybody loved it and the pandemic hit. Um, and then, um, you know, plot twist. Uh, after this uh, terrible tragedy of this spanking new studio that is a big hunk of Manhattan real estate that's crazy expensive to run, and how would you be able to do it when the theater stopped? Uh, this really amazing magical journey began. So um, we're going to be talking to Jeff a little bit this evening about that journey and uh, the Broadway Relief Project. So um, for those who may not know, uh, there is a documentary that the Playbill YouTube channel uh, has um, put forward uh, as of earlier this week. And I believe it runs through Sunday night, March 21st. You can stream it and watch it for free. Uh, it is very brief. It's only about 20 minutes long, but um, I've watched it three times because it is uh, just that inspiring. And it is the story of the Broadway Relief Project and how uh, Jeff led a uh, group of theater people, uh, actors, performers, ward wardrobe people, costume people, stage managers, producers, uh, uh, to um, come in and uh, make PPE that was missing uh, and uh, basically save the day in a very big way. Uh, I truly consider this to be one of the great stories in our theater history and um, one of the most heroic uh, uh, experiences I've, I've witnessed in my lifetime. Uh, uh, really, I put it up there with how uh, theater responded to the AIDS crisis with uh, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS and with um, uh, the, well, there were two separate organizations at the beginning. I was there for that one. Uh, but, um, but this is, I, I think, really a jewel in our crown and something that we as a community can be so proud of. So before we begin, just uh, one or two housekeeping things. Hello, Ellen. I'm delighted you're here. And um, uh, uh, those are, number one, uh, here at Grateful Ready, Open, Willing, we um, talk with theater luminaries and create these uh, recordings uh, for your inspiration, edification, pleasure. And uh, we only ask in return that you give to Broadway Cares or the Actors Fund, your choice. Many of you are already doing that on an ongoing basis. Um, it's so important that we as a community support one another. So uh, all of our guests have donated their time uh, and uh, we only ask that you pay it forward. We understand that uh, people are facing some hard times in our community. And sometimes you don't really have a lot of money to give, but sometimes you can give five dollars and sometimes you hit a week where you got a fourteen hundred dollar relief check and you could give a little more so uh whatever that is will be most appreciated for all of our efforts uh whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching it in replay uh so thank you for uh whatever you can do to support one another and if it isn't in a contribution perhaps it's in an act of kindness or the way we reach out to help one another uh through this uh so um the other thing is we're on stream yard and uh, because we ask that all donations go directly to Broadway Cares or the Actors Fund, uh, we have a little StreamYard logo on there. And it means um, unless you are signed up to StreamYard, your name will not show up when you comment. It will just say Facebook user. That's got to do with the legal agreement between StreamYard and Facebook. So just know that. And it doesn't mean you have to sign up for StreamYard. It just means if you want us to know who you are, please type in your name um, before you put your comment so that we'll see your name and we'll be able to say hello to you. Uh, all right. So those are the housekeeping things I can think of. Lindsay, am I forget anything? Thank you. Let's go to the main event. So Jeff Whiting, um, so many questions for you. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to start about your experience of the Broadway Relief Project? I'm sure that one question could take <laughs> care of us for the next 45 minutes, but, but I'm just wondering, <laughs> is there anything you would like to lead us off with in this story? Well, sure, and thank you so much for inviting me to, to come tonight. It's it's uh, wonderful to catch up and, and chat a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think the the main thing that was most wonderful about the Broadway Relief Project was 
you know, not only, you know, when this all began, we were all sitting watching TV, just going, watching those on the front lines, not knowing that we could help and just feeling helpless. And the fact that we had this opportunity, the city reached out to us, gave us the realization that, yeah, we actually had something, the Broadway community could do something to come together and really provide something that made a difference. So I think it, it gave us, you know, not only the ability to do something and feel purposeful, but to, for this group who came together, the over 400 people who came together to make it happen, it gave us somewhere to go and gave us hope instead of just sitting at home, we're able to really you know, put our focus into this one effort. So it was a, a really rewarding time that we had you know, to be able to connect with one another. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I have a question. Uh, first of all, for those of you who have not seen it, um, the documentary, it's called The Show Must Go On. And if you Google, oops, our <laughs> Our faces change. Uh, if you Google uh, um, or internet search uh, the show must go on Broadway Relief Project, uh, it will come up. Uh, if you just put in the show must go on, 8,000 things will come up uh, because that's a very popular <laughs> title. So um, if you look up uh, Broadway Relief Project, the show must go on. Um, as I said, it's streaming on the Playbill YouTube channel through Sunday night, March 21st. Jeff, what happens to it after that? Like I teach a preparing for the profession class at NYU, which I've mm -hmm. done for 20 years. I would like to show this to my students toward the end of the semester as a go out and do wonderful things like this. Will we be able to find it again? Do you know? Well, you may you may have to go out to the film festival. So I think I think what's going to happen is it's going to make the film festival circuit, and then once it's completed, you know that journey, then I think we'll be able, it'll be you know more widely available again. So it's, this is really a, a one during this week a, a chance to catch it before it goes on its tour. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So, so eventually we'll find it again online. Yeah, yes. certainly. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want it to be lost. It's too, uh, it's too important. Uh, and it's, uh, as a community, you know, it's a part of our story together. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, my understanding is that, uh, Open Jar Studios closed like everything did all at once. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you spoke to somebody, you know, in the governor's office and there was a shortage of PPE. And that was the really terrible thing is doctors and nurses and frontline workers were working without masks, without gowns, without protective equipment uh, for taking care of patients. Uh, patients were in mm -hmm. hospitals during a COVID epidemic with no personal protective equipment. And of course it's mm -hmm. supposed to be worn once and thrown away for sanitary reasons. And we didn't have enough. And what was being manufactured was being manufactured because all of that comes from one place on the planet, Wuhan, China. And they uh, both, needed it and were operating under a quarantine where workers couldn't get out to make it. So suddenly we were dependent on a, a singular resource that dried up and disappeared. Um, so how did that happen? Did you call this person or did this person call you? What was the yeah. conversation? Yeah, they called me actually. I was, I was in the process of walking around the studios, turning out the lights, turning off the air conditioning, just not knowing when if ever I would come back. And so I was actually quite emotional walking around. And as I was in studio 11M here in the studios, I got a call from uh, my friend, Neil, uh, who works at, who works in government. And he said, you know, we're, I'm, I'm working on putting together a call for the governor's office. We keep hearing that Broadway wants to help and nobody's really organized anything. And if I know anybody who's good at organizing, it's Jeff. And so he said, I just thought I would call to see, would you be willing to just try to put together like all the key players on Broadway and just let's get on a call with the governor's office and just see how could broad what could Broadway individuals do? What could the Broadway community do? So it started really just by me putting out an email to everybody I could think of that was, you know, producers and key players in the industry, just saying, let's get together and figure out how we can help. And that really began a tornado of emails and phone calls. And I ended up in that tornado on a phone call with uh, the Economic Development Corporation, uh, who had been charged uh, by the city of New York, they needed 10 million gowns. And so uh, I was on a call with it was me and it was four other factories like that make clothing for a living like that's what they do and she said to this group you know can you know can you make mat can you mass produce if we give you the pattern 
um, could you mass produce these garments? And so I'm listening to these factories that you know make clothes for Ralph Lauren and Gap and like major labels and they, that's what they do. And here's me sort of representing the Broadway community and what do I know about sewing? Nothing. Um, but I, I, as I was listening to them talk, I said, well, we have those people I've already been in contact with over at that point, over 700 stitchers have said, I can stitch, I'd be willing to help. So I said, well, we've got, I have up to 700 people who are willing to do it. You know, I've got a giant space. I can transform it into a PPE factory. Why not? It was sort of like Mickey and Judy. Well, I got a barn, let's put on a show. And so I, um, I actually, what's very strange is as a kid, my father owned a factory. He made a he had a factory that made gym bags and backpacks. And so every summer as I was growing up, I would work at the factory. And so I found myself flashing back to what did they do at dad's factory? <laughs> so, so in a way I kind of knew what it looked like. And so I pitched on this call just saying, yeah, the Broadway community, we can put together a coalition of, of all these stitchers and sewers who have the skills and I'll figure out how to get fabric and figure out how to get cut. And, you know, I said, sure, we'll do it. And so I basically like at the end of that phone call was like, I think I'm now going to have to mass produce hospital gowns. And so <laughs> that's how it happened. I just said, yeah, we'll figure it out. And so I, I began a quest to find fabric. They sent me the pattern, but then, you know, the pat the, we had to make a prototype, which had to get approved. I had to figure out, you know, what was the cost of making each gown? Cause the city essentially bought the gowns from us. So we, I had to come up with a price and I, you know, I, so I sent in the bid of the price and, um, you know, thank heavens they accepted our bid. And so we went to town, but that's kind of how it got started. You know, I just want to say anybody who still has the question, why is this group uh, of the theater community and the show business community called Grateful, Ready, Open, Willing? Um, I, I heard there, gratitude, readiness, openness, and willingness in all capitals. Um, uh, you know, the gratitude for your background, your experience, even your job as a kid working in your dad's factory, how yeah. all of those gifts came together, obviously all of your work in theater and having the newly opened studio and the space, um, your connections to not just the, the person in the government, but also, you know, the theater community designers, wardrobe people, people you could ask, uh, the readiness, which, you know, there you were in Studio 11 M, M for Miracle, you know, and <laughs> turning out the lights and very emotional. And, you know, mm -hmm. readiness isn't just about, okay, I've been working up toward this and I'm ready. Readiness is also about, I am at the nadir of my career, all of my feelings. I'm very emotional and very sad. I'm feeling very defeated and being ready when that call comes to embrace it and to rise up mm -hmm. and say, I will do this. I will go into a meeting of all these great fashion people who understand fabric and I know nothing and I am ready. I am open to learning. I'm open to listening. I'm open to inspiration that comes. Um, my partner has this wonderful saying, uh, we, we ask God in words, God answers us in synchronicity. You know, we pray in words, we get, we receive our answer in synchronicity oh, and things work, nice. you know, you know? and, uh, cool. And the willingness, which just just blows me away. It's it's just beautiful, such a beautiful story. You know, one of the my favorite moments in the documentary is when um, Robin McGee says, "We all wanted to help. We all we all wanted to do something." It was like, well, I don't know. You know, I'm a costume designer. I don't know what to do. And then she she saw the article in the paper that they had no PPE and they were using Yankee Stadium ponchos, and she said, mm -hmm. "Well, I could do better than that." <laughs> Yeah, I think she literally texted me. She texted me that picture of that article. She said, we can do the better than this. And I was like, yeah, that's good. And that's exactly what we will do. <laughs> Sometimes that kind of prompting is just, yeah. it's just all it takes. It's well, you just... mentioned it too, the, the willingness of what you just mentioned. The, that This community's willingness to just, A, say yes to do the project, but to help me because, okay, I, I sort of got us involved, but I really didn't know how to sew, what it took, you know, what kind of machines do you need? And so Rob and McGee and there are other really wonderful key partners that just said, okay, here's what you need to do. You need this kind of thread you need. To, and 
everybody, willingness is the word that comes forward. Everybody wanted to help and, and stepped forward. Otherwise, if I had tried to do it with the limited knowledge I had, there would be no way that it could have happened. So it's so key. The willingness thing is really wonderful. To see. And community, community with a capital mm -hmm. C. I mean, that's my, I always tell my students and I always say to young actors, uh, you know, my, Lindsay, what's my favorite thing about this business? <laughs> <laughs> you know, community, community with a capital yeah. C that this community is just so magnificent. And now you've, you've not just turned out those gowns and all of that PPE, but isn't Broadway Relief Project responsible for the singer's mask and the, mm -hmm. is it called the headset mask and the instrumentalist, yes. like adapting mm -hmm. masks for people in our industry to be able to work and have uh, mm. I, I mean, nothing's risk-free, of course, but the masks reduce transmission of the virus by 40 to 60 percent. So, you mm. know, didn't you create those? How did those come about? Yeah, that was a, that really came about, you know, once we had finished our last order of gowns for the city, you know, we started we started thinking, well, what else could we do? We've got with sort of this uh, thing going on. What else could we do? By that time, gowns had kind of you know, those who are making gowns, the real gowns were caught up. And so there wasn't me, but I said, well, what about masks? Like at that time we had been wearing masks for, you know, five months. And I just said, what if there was a mask that like could hold the fabric away from your mouth so that when you're singing, you don't breathe in a, a, a mouthful of fabric. And so I called Robin McGee and I said, could we come up with a way to to do that and just put some interior structure. So she and I like kind of sketched some possible ideas. And, and so she on her home machine sewed up three or four different prototypes and brought them over here to the studio. And I tried them on and went, oh, I like that. This is cool. And we ended up doing, uh, yeah, what we call the singer's mask. I've got mine right here. So Great. it's basically like, it, it's, it's, it's got an interior structure. So it keeps the fabric away from your mouth but it also has a wire all across the, where the nose and the cheek are. So you can actually form it to fit on your face. So you can actually control, you know, that the, the air not escaping up through this, up through your nose or getting in your glasses and whatnot. And so, yeah, so what we, we put the prototype together, I think early July. And since that time, we, uh, we've been making them as fast as we can. So we've got a team working around the clock that are really making these happen. So yeah, I think to date we've, we've get, we've made over 200,000 of these things. So the, the, the last statistic I read was over <laughs> 250,000, but oh, yeah, is that right? oh, there that's you go. what I read online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. and you know, the thing that, that is so amazing, because again, I'm, I'm a spectator in all of this, you know, um, I, I, and I observed, um, two things. One is there was a whole thing about the, uh, that came out in the media about six feet apart was very much um, what was required. But for singers, spittle projection is such just naturally in the human instrument when it sings it, it, that it was 16 feet. And how could you ever possibly stage a show with everybody 16 feet apart? And, and they were basically all pronouncing our work and our community, you know, dead on arrival, we'd never come back. And I, I'm telling you, it was maybe the next day, but I think it was the next moment I saw an ad for that on Facebook. And I was like, okay, we're just, we're just filled with answers. We are just ready, open, willing, grateful. We're, we're coming up with stuff. You know, one of the things in the, in the documentary was somebody had said uh, exactly that, that um, I, I think it might've been Don who said, you're, uh, we're, we don't know how to do this, but then the question becomes, how can we imagine it? Yeah, and that's you know, so that true. was Stella Adler. Your art is your imagination. That was, those were her <laughs> words, you know? That's right, yeah, yeah. Well, I cannot count the number of times that my staff has pivoted. You know, I, when I, the day I got us together and said, okay, we're gonna make gowns. Wait, we're gonna what? We're gonna make <laughs> hospital gowns. Just go with me on this. So it's like, okay, so you're gonna be in charge of figuring out how to do the delivery. You're gonna figure out the pattern. And we're, none of us do any of those things. And so Don, who you saw in the documentary, he, he and I just laughed because I was like, okay, we gotta cut uh, Rigoline. We need th 330,000 pieces of Rigoline. Okay, how do you do it? How can we do that quickly? And he's, I call him MacGyver. He's like the MacGyver of Broadway. And he would be like, oh, if we had a drill, we could just like, instead of wrapping it, I could put a drill bit and like spin it 
200 times and then just cut everything once and now you have the perfect size thing but you didn't have to like cut each piece individually so he single-handedly solved so many problems that we just we were faced with so he and i would just sit together and go okay well how can we figure this out what do we know about it well we know it's this long how can we get that done 250,000 times as fast as possible? So yeah, we, we were all definitely out of the comfort zone. And again, then I said, now we're gonna make masks. We're gonna make what? Masks, yeah, go with me on this. And every time <laughs> my staff here must think I'm crazy, but the, every single time they have just said, great, let's figure out how to make it happen. So it's it's been amazing to see their ability to rebound and be willing to jump in when, when help is needed. Beautiful. I'm, I I can hear your thoughts, Lindsay. It's a lot like working at our office, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Guess what we're doing next? We have this new project. Okay. Let's let's do that then. Because <laughs> you know, in casting, it's like one day it's we want a traditional musical and we're casting these roles, and the next day is we have a new musical and this person has to sing bass and ride aerial silks. And it's like, <laughs> okay, we have to identify a community of people who are aerial silk experts. I mean, it's just whatever comes in, that's what we're doing. And we always figure it out because that's what we do. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Damon is asking out of curiosity, was there demand for the gowns outside of New York or was the work ultimately New York only? Oh, great. Thanks, Damon. Uh, the truth is we, we were so busy with New York, so we were just focusing on that. But once New York was done, I actually reached out to almost every state I could find the information for to say, hey, we are set up if you need help. Because I think when we when our peak was going down, then there was needs in Arizona and other places. So I immediately reached out to those uh states and the the websites that they gave and offered our services and there were there were maybe three or four states that were that put us on the list and you know as a possibility and in the end i think what happened was the productions you know those in china and elsewhere that make them really really quickly and cheaply were just you know it, they had caught up to the demand by that time so wow. so we we certainly offered our services but by the time by the time we finished the new york stuff the, we couldn't make them any cheaper than they can make them you know, elsewhere. Of so, course. So there just wasn't that demand, but we're, we were available. That makes sense. <laughs> well, you were there when most needed. That's the extraordinary, yeah. you know. I mean, it's, yeah, that's, uh, that was the time of most need for sure. We're happy to be like there at that them. time. Yeah, that moment in the Bible where the, the, I think it's Mordecai says to Esther, perhaps you were born for just such a time as this and oh. and that rising to the occasion. Um, you know, it, it brings up a question for me and um, I, I somehow it's, I, I, I have this terrible um, uh, knack for bringing up politics in uh, theater situations. But, you know, I, I was raised by people like Harold Clurban and Stella Adler who taught me art is politics, it is. Um, you know, I, I always teach my NYU students that uh, early on, you know, uh, um, uh, Russian drama got all the way to Chekhov, arguably the greatest dramatist in all of, of modern drama, possibly all of history. And Stalin brought in censorship from the political angle and that stopped Russian drama. And, and the development of it. And, and, um, and so I don't think they're able to be separated, but I'm, I'm really curious for you, um, you know, we had an administration that wasn't dealing with this, which was a, a big problem. And uh, uh, Mike Pence and Jared Kushner were put in charge of these things. So dealing with all that you were dealing with and the project before you and trying to create it out of thin air to answer this need to help hospital workers and, and people who were dying in this situation, when when Jared Kushner changed the White House website to say that the stockpiles of equipment and what they that the U.S. Uh, federal government has that is for the people of this country, and he said something in a press conference, uh, you may remember about how that's not that's not yours, that's not for the states, that's ours, that's mm -hmm. the federal government. And then they went in and changed the website and the wording to say that the national stockpile of these things actually did belong to them and it was not for the states. The people live in the states. Uh, I, that blew my mind and made me completely crazy. And I'm just curious: Did you were you even able to take that in, or were you just too busy at that point? Like, what was that? Uh, like? We were. I, I I do remember that. I, I remember seeing that on the news. And you know, the truth is, we were so busy. We were just like heads down doing what we were doing. But I certainly do remember having a strange reaction to you know here at a time when 
look, all of us are in the same boat. How, how often is that true? Not always. And so in a time when absolutely every person on this planet is faced with this to make that the time to claim what is yours, I think uh, nearly everybody else on the planet was offering to help. And so that it did seem very strange that anybody would take an action like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know in the AIDS crisis when the theater community's response was so dramatic and so great and helping when no one else would help, um, mm -hmm. you know, it was very connected to politics. We had a president mm -hmm. at the time who would not utter the acronym AIDS in the eight years of his presidency. And uh, we in the theater community, we were losing people left and right and, and we were dealing with it and we rose to the occasion and said, we are, we are going to solve this because no one else will. Uh, so I, I get it, I feel that. Um, the other thing, when you were answering Damon's question, uh, uh, was um, uh, the in the documentary um, "Windsor Cleaners," uh, the Tony Award winner, the Tony Award winning Windsor Cleaners, um, they were uh, you know gave you their vans and you collaborated with that and. And rather than, um, I mean, I know there were some pallets with the big canvas baskets and everything in there, but uh, the footage of delivering back and forth the um, mm -hmm. uh, materials to be stitched to all the stitchers working from home and such, and then the van collecting it, we see a lot of people just taking bags by hand and putting them in the van mm -hmm. and sometimes taking lots of bags and assembly line, throwing mm -hmm. them up in the van. Um, it feels very individual and personal and people run and not very, manufactory can you talk to that at all what that experience was like yeah i mean i have to say it. it's it's um uh the idea that so many individuals were willing to help and you know all of them said i want to help but i can't really get to you and so uh my staff devised a way and windsor cleaner made it happen they said look let us deliver and so my my staff uh, put together a, basically a bus route, two bus routes. And so every day, every twice a week, what would happen is these two vans would get filled up with individual packs and these stitchers would say, I can probably do two this week or I could do one. Or I, Some of them took up to seven per week and they each bag was filled with materials for 30 gowns. And so they, they just knew how many they could take. So they would let us know how many. And so we they would stop at the, there are I think 18 different stops in all the boroughs. And so you would choose the stop that was closest to your home. You would take your you know, rolling luggage or whatever, and you would throw those bags into your luggage, take it home. You would have then one week to sew them together. You would bring them back. And then one week later, you would swap it out for another unfinished one. So that was pretty cool. I actually get emotional thinking about it because it took so many people's effort to make it happen. And Windsor Cleaner stepped forward and made it happen. And all these, I think over 230 stitchers every day trudged. Some of them walked miles to get to that stop, you know. And it was a pretty amazing sacrifice that everybody made to to for that effort so and, yeah, and in a pandemic cool. you know it's not like in regular yeah. times they walked miles it's like no yeah. one was going out and we were told not to go out and we were told it was unsafe to go out because so little yeah. was known about the virus it lived on surfaces it lived in the air it's dangerous please stay home and here they are mm -hmm. with their suitcase bringing you know yeah. fabric it was it was pretty amazing yeah I love theater people. I just, you know, one of my one of my favorite phrases is theater people are wonderful. Uh, I just That's true. It's yeah. Um, and I guess this, in a way, you know, we spend so much time in the theater improvising, you know, somebody drops a line, you pick it up for them. And so in a way, I guess it shouldn't surprise us that the theater community did this because it was like, well, something's missing. Let I guess maybe we're wired to do that, but definitely this team definitely was wired to help out. Yeah, we are. I always, I always say that, you know, if it were up to me, I would make every single person entering college do two years of theater training, regardless of what their major <laughs> is going to be. Just like in Israel, everybody has to do two years in the army. I think if everybody did two years of theater training, our society would just function so much better. You know, <laughs> uh, even the way people walk down the street, you know, there'd be spatial awareness, everything would work better. Um, there's a bunch of questions coming in and I've just been so entranced with you. Um, uh, there we go, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, will you be thinking of making show specific masks when we return? 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's something that we're working on now. So yes. I got an email from uh, Moulin Rouge. I'm one of the many mailing lists I'm on that their Moulin Rouge mask is available. You can purchase it now, pre-order. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So so some of the shows. Yeah, it seems like yeah, masks are going to be around for a while. So even after the shows are open, we can't wait for that day. That'll be amazing. Mm, for sure. It's going to feel good. Uh, Ellen wants to know, are they available to individuals or groups or like, how would yeah. you get one? Yeah, you can go. You can go to our website. Uh, you can go to BroadwayReliefProject.com or TheSingersMask.com, and you can buy buy a single one. There are group discounts. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, so yeah, you can buy it as a group. As a group, we've had you know many large groups getting them for choirs, the whole you know uh, school district, and then you know you can just buy one or two for your own personal use. So yeah, either way. Amazing. And is that also true of the instrumentalist mask and the headset mask uh -huh. as well? Yep. They're all That's at right. the same place. They're all on the same website. The, uh, only the only the singer's mask is on Amazon. The others are not yet on Amazon. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. We got to take care of our techies here too. You know? That's uh, right. That's right. <laughs> so Joy Hermelin, I love Joy Hermelin, one of my favorite, oh. favorite members of our community. I love you, Joy Hermelin. Uh, she says, not only did you create a beautiful space for her to teach voice lessons, but this incredible venture proves how scrappy and helpful the theater community is. Many friends were there at Open Jar working hard. Mine too. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you isn't enough for your efforts on behalf of all of us. The question on everyone's lips, how do we actually reopen? Any thoughts? There is thread going re-vaccine, making vaccines mandatory. Equity hasn't said enough yet. Value your opinion. Mm, thank you, Joy. You are amazing. We're honored to have you here at the studios when you are. Um, yeah, I mean, the, my thoughts are certainly positive. It's been wonderful to see the vaccine being rolled out. And we noticed here at the studios that, you know, as the vaccine became more widely available, studios were being filled with rehearsals. And so we happen to know, you know, there are lots of shows that are, you know, going into rehearsal and getting started. So that to me just, you know, makes me so happy to see that it is going to happen. You know, as for, you know, how it's gonna happen and what equity, you know, will decide and what they'll end up, you know, wanting to do, I think is up to them. I think they're, I'm sure they're looking at the, the developing medical science and finding ways. I think, you know, their initial work was, you know, based on what was known about the virus at that time. And so I'm hopeful that they'll, continue to learn since we know so much more about the virus and how how it transmits and how it's, uh, it travels, you know, that they can update the, those uh, guidelines as well. There's certainly a lot of other opportunities of testing that's more widely available and affordable. So I, 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 I'm certain that the union will take advantage of frequent testing as opposed to, I think right now they only require testing once a week. But actually, you know, you could you could be tested. You know, the the film world is alive and well, and they're testing every other day. And I've been learning a lot about that recently. You know, that you can actually, if you test every other day or every forty eight hours, you can catch things more quickly, and then therefore allow people to be working together in, in, in a way and be able to, you know, catch something before somebody became infectious. You could get them you know, isolated. So that gives me real hope. And I'm certain that the unions are taking a close look at that and hopefully they'll update their their um, uh, protocols for that. Beautiful, thank you. And I'll just add to that, uh, Joy and anyone else, um, the, uh, the last talk I did was uh, on the anniversary of the Broadway shutdown. So it was March 12th or 13th. I'm not sure how I tallied that. Uh, but I talk a lot about that and about things reopening. And Lincoln Center is building 10 outdoor stages uh, to use this summer. Um, and then since that video over the past week, it was announced that Shakespeare in the Park will be back this summer. So. Uh, you know, we're, we're theater people. And as Jeff and the Broadway Relief Project illustrate, we're unstoppable and we, we will be back. Um, you know, in terms of industry gossip, I can tell you that a lot of the producers I, I talk to um, and a lot of the folks at, at my end of the industry in casting, uh, we, uh, we do have conversations about this ongoing and have for a year now. And what was expected to be early 22, uh, sorry, early 2022 uh, is now starting to be considered with vaccinations and the new administration in and the results of 
as, as they've said, every adult who wants a vaccination will be vaccinated by May, that it could very realistically be we're going to start some things in the fall. Um, again, as uh, part of my talk, I talked about the uh, some of the uh, stages coming back as part of the New York pop-up series that's being done. And uh, even though it's just one or two actors on stage, and even though there's a limit right now of 150 people, uh, I think it's 150 for outdoor, 100 for indoor, um, we are having our beloved treasured people of the theater singing on Broadway stages with audiences in the house. So, you know, there's always going to be a space between where we're coming from and where we ideally want to get to. And we are in that space now. We are in a different place than we were a year ago, six months ago, three months ago. We're really in a different place and the vaccinations are making a lot of difference. The information's changing like weekly uh, now um, in terms of restrictions being relaxed. And I, I think that we all see this is like, this is possible. The light is at the end of the tunnel or as a friend of mine said, yes, and there's skylights in the tunnel. Um, so, so we're doing, <laughs> you know, we're doing quite well there. Um, so I'm so happy about that. Um, let me, oops, sorry. Um, that's my, my little pad with my notes so I don't forget any questions. Um, Yes, friends who are doing that. You know, one of my favorite parts of the documentary, and again, if you haven't seen it, it's only uh, streaming right now through Sunday night before it goes on the film festival circuit in case you're tuning in here a little late. Uh, so uh, try to get to it. It's only 20 minutes long and it's glorious. And my, one of my favorite parts is at the end when you list the names of all the people who volunteered to help. And uh, members of this group, uh, Jeff Williams, RJ McGee, uh, people so dear to my heart, Roy Gabe, Tara, uh, um, Tara Rubin, Bess Glorioso. I love you, Bess Glorioso. Um, uh, just Jonathan Parks, just great, great people just doing this work all together. I, I mean, it's um, it's so exciting to to see those names there. And, you know, having seen all the little bits of people showing the gowns and doing things for you, bloating the trucks and all, and to recognize that's us, that's our, that's our people, that's our family, our community, you know? Um, it's just so, so wonderful. Um, oh, there are so many things I wanna, I wanna talk to you about. Um, uh, the, the other thing I was going to say earlier is that um, my first awareness of this was you put something out on social media, and I think it might have been to Beowulf Borat or to one of the designers and said, I'm meeting with somebody from the governor's office. Are you available? Can you talk to me? It's tomorrow morning. And it was like 10 o'clock at night, and I saw this thing, and I was like, <laughs> Jeff Whiting, what are you doing? <laughs> so, so when you referenced earlier that you just started talking to people and putting out feelings, was that part of what you did? You just went out on social media and was like, come now. <laughs> like what yeah, happened? I, I think what I did was I, I put out, uh, I think I put together a, like a Google form or something. I just sent it to everybody I knew saying, we're going to do a call, whatever day it was. And I just said, sign up here and just let me know like in advance, like what your expertise is. So then we could sort of coordinate you know, who could be on which call and that kind of thing. And yeah, Bay Beowulf was a brilliant designer, of course. And he oh God, yeah. he rose to the occasion and he was here frequently folding gowns, putting them in the boxes. So he was one of our regulars, you know, making it happen. It was amazing to see his support. Just amazing. Everything Tara Rubin too. Tara was here folding gowns, putting them in boxes, inspecting the gowns. So we it was pretty cool to see. Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, and 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 you know the thing that that struck me was everywhere I saw something on social media with you reaching out and making an ask, it was mm -hmm. like my social media streams, I just saw the word yes everywhere. It's like, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, I'll be there. Yes, I can. Yes, let's mm -hmm. talk. Yeah. I mean, you were just igniting this wildfire of yes from a community who so wants to help and has so much to give. And you mm -hmm. asked and and there was just this symphony of yes. Did you feel that? I absolutely did feel that. It was so cool to just know that there were so many people who were willing to help. It was just then figuring out, you know, how could we most help? I, I think really that was signified, you know, in those days at 7 p.m., everybody in the city who was locked in their rooms would applaud and cheer for the frontline workers. And, you know, that's just a small example of everybody in the city you know, wanted to help. And even if you could just cheer people on as they changed their shift, you know, that's the one thing that you could do. So I think everybody this year has, been, has really stepped forward and just done whatever they possibly could to help. Yeah, I'm so convinced that's what, that's what brought us here to this community. So many mm -hmm. of us, you know, I, I recognize that for some people it's, oh, I want to be a star or something. 
but I think for so many of us, it's that community that um, it's just invaluable. There's just nothing like it. Um, and, and also the way, you know, in community, people who have no idea what they're doing and figure it out, help other people who are trying to figure it out. And I, was it Robin McGee in your, uh, in, in your uh, um, documentary who talked about, I took pictures to make an instruction sheet because we couldn't be all together in a costume house where people could ask questions. So I needed to make it as thorough as possible so people wouldn't have any questions. Was that? That was fascinating to me because I, as I said earlier, I know nothing about sewing. So I was just like, well, how hard could it be? You just sew it together, you put the sleeve. But like, how wrong was I? <laughs> like, you know, as I learned like, oh, there's different machines and it needs different numbers of thread. And to do the cuff, you need to have this. And part of the cuff was stretchy. And so you needed a different needle. And, and so she volunteered. So she's filmed herself basically sewing each portion so that when they came back and when people opened them, they all looked the same. Now I will admit they were crazy colors because we just, once we found the fabric that there was a, a certain consistency that the fabric needed, but they didn't have a color requirement. So once I found that fabric, I bought it in every crazy color. And so out there somewhere are these crazy, sometimes one arm is one color, the other arm is another color, but we just wanted to make every possible bit of fabric into a gown. And so, so there are some beautiful gowns out there created by the best stitchers on Broadway that were, you know, worn in a hospital and, you know, but, but made with such love. And yeah, Robin uh, made a wonderful series of videos and we put them in a, a private Facebook group where the stitchers could ask each other questions about what do you do when you get to the hem and this happens. And, and they were just all helping one another. It was so cool to, to see them. And then another person said, oh, I found a way to do the, the belts faster. And she would videotape herself doing that. So everybody was just really helping each other. It was so cool to watch. It's amazing. I, I just, you're, you're talking and I'm thinking of Schindler's List when, when you know, he wanted to save people and he, mm. he um, you know, just donating everything he could find and saying, yeah, I need more workers for this and I need more of this. And, and then when it was all over, he was like looking at the ring on his finger and saying, I could, I could have used this. I could have saved another life with this, mm -hmm. like every yeah. scrap. And when you were talking about getting every scrap of fabric and no matter what the color scheme was putting it together to save lives, it, it just yeah. reminds me of that kind of, um, that kind of stakes, you know, um, it's just yeah. so beautiful. It's just such an amazing, heroic thing that you created uh, for all of us. And I just, um, mm. just so floored by it. It's, it's just magnificent. You, you had uh, mm -hmm. a, one shot in the documentary showed the, the dry erase board on which you or someone wrote, entering this room, you become a hero. It's true. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, everybody, it was so cool to see everyone come in each day because you know we were when you came in the city was shut down but we were operating as an essential business so we were walking into work with an empty city completely empty times square which was empty and to walk in and have a, a a group of people who are working together for this one thing and so that that phrase was written and often changed by Michael Krug, who's an amazing stage manager, he's stage manager of, of uh, the national tour of Dear Evan Hansen. And he, he was in charge of the shipping department and still is to this day. Um, and he, he, he came and knocked out the first day we had people here in the studio, you know, when we did, you know, the first round. Um, I was up here late at night in my office, just like trying to figure out what we were gonna do the next day. And, and I was in the darkness and uh, staring at my computer and, and I'll, in walks Michael Krug and he goes, he knocked on my open door and he goes, can I help you? And I was like, oh no, no, we're fine. We, 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 we'll figure it out. And he goes, no, let me help you. <laughs> and he could just see that he knew there were things that we could be doing to better. And so he just said, let me, how about if I take this off your plate? And I was like, really, can you do that? He's like, yes, I got it. And so he said, he's been here basically a year now. He's in charge of, he, he runs the whole place now. So uh, it, it, it's an amazing uh, revelation of, of people's um, personality and their willingness to be of help. I love us. I just love <laughs> us. I, yeah. uh, 
<laughs> it's just such a joy to be a part of this community. I um, So when you say he still is here now, um, is Broadway Relief Project still going on? Is it just the masks? Yeah. Are you still making gowns and PPE? Tell us what's happening now. Yeah, it is still going on. Yeah, the Broadway Relief Project is the makers of the singer's mask. And so while we're not making gowns anymore, we are making masks as fast as we possibly can. And so, yeah, so Michael Krug's in charge of uh, getting the materials, getting them out to all the all the sewers and then get them back here. They get inspected. They go through a, a process that when they get here, they get inspected. And they also form the wire into the shape of the nose and cheeks before they go into the boxes. So there's a whole small army of people that are mm. constantly, you know, shaping these masks. And yeah, Michael Krug is a key part of that team. And that's spectacular. Uh, yeah, I think of the, uh, I, I don't know if it's the last line of the film, but it's toward the end. One of the voiceovers says, uh, it may be Robin who says, uh, we have stories to tell, we'll be back. Yeah, yeah. And I just, yeah. I, I love that because I feel that's so true. Um, is there opportunity for us to help since things are still going on? Do you still need people? If somebody is like, yeah. okay, it was scary then, but now I'm feeling a little more comfortable with getting out and doing things and I can volunteer, or I can contribute. What would people do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you wanted to get involved, you could go to our website, broadwayreliefproject.com and you could drop an email to our to our support team. You'll see support. And if you you know want to come and be a part of the, the mask making team or help in any way, uh, Brian Deutsch, who's uh, our, one of our amazing team members here, would reach out to you and, and help you find a way to do it. It's fantastic. Thank you, Lindsay, for putting that in the chat. You know, um, there may be a, a, a sequel to this too, even though it's still running. Uh, and I'll tell you how that happened. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this past week on uh, NPR, uh, WMYC, Brian Lehrer's show in the morning, uh, there's an Ask the Mayor segment. And I called in uh, last Friday and uh, they got <laughs> Lindsay laughing because yes, I did flirt with the mayor of New York City and I did flirt with Brian Lehrer on national radio. <laughs> Don't care, no shame, theater person. Um, anyway, uh, in the midst of that, uh, what I called in to say to him was, uh, you know, uh, all of us who work in the theater, we are looking at what you are doing with the vaccine rollout and what we very much appreciate it in the progress. There, there's a whole army of incredibly capable people who work in the Broadway community and can help. Uh, all of us on social media are always laughing with one another saying, get three equity stage managers in charge of that vaccine rollout and it'll be done in three days because <laughs> this is what we do. I mean, I, as a casting director, when you see a show and there's 22 people on stage, well, trust that I saw 25,000 people to get those 22 people on stage and all of those people were funneled through appointments times, getting the right material, making sure they showed up prepared, knew where to go, knew when to go. Uh, <laughs> it only shows up as Facebook user, but that is awesome. Justin Trudeau <laughs> would say, come back. Um, that I, was uh, Anthony, of course. Of course it was. Hello, Anthony. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, so anyway, I, I, I put it out there and I said, you know, you have, I, I said to Mayor de Blasio, you have a workforce in the Broadway community that no one else in the world has. It only mm -hmm. exists here. And we are ready to help. We are standing at the ready. We want to help. Call upon us. We know how to do this. Have you never been in a Broadway theater where some of those nice ladies with doily collars have gotten 1,500 people back and forth to the bathroom safely in 15 minutes and back to their exact assigned seats? I, I mean, we're the people. And so um, he did one of those you know, give your information to WMIC. I'd like to talk to you, but also he and I were at NYU together at the same time. So I'd mentioned that as well. And, um, and so I got a call from his office today and I spoke with a woman there who basically said, uh, this sounds so great. Uh, first of all, she's a big fan of the theater just in general, but also she said, you know, I, I uh, have, we've been trying to figure out some of this, like who are the people who know how to do this better than the medical industry and the profession that's doing it. And you just hit on it. So we're going to have another conversation on Monday and begin to talk about 
who the people are in our industry who, you know, maybe I can connect her with and such. And Jeff, okay. your name will be at the top of my list. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, just the unions to talk to equity yeah. about the stage management teams and who's out of work and who would be able to help with this and what mm -hmm. we can do because we're, um, we're theater people. We're just amazing. You know, so yeah, yeah. so whatever happens with that, and I hope something does, um, uh, but whatever happens with that, uh, I will always personally and uh, speaking on behalf of this entire community, we will all always be indebted for you uh, to you for leading the charge and for creating something here that is just notorious. And I'm so grateful that uh, Paul and Nathan created this documentary and came up with that idea because there, there ought to be a record uh, of this for posterity. Uh, WMYC, Brian Lehrer's show, is putting together a time capsule about the pandemic. And uh, mm -hmm. maybe you can look that up and, and get this in there, get that documentary on a USB drive and get it in there because they're going to open it, mm. I think, 10 or 20 years from now to oh, look at what happened. That's a great idea. Oh, that's this interesting. Is, yeah. This is a yeah. big thing that happened. I mean, I know <laughs> we work in the theater and, you know, we're, we're busy with the minutia that's in front of us to make sure everything goes right. And you, as you said, mm -hmm. you know, we had our heads down and we were in the work. So yeah. it's hard to see sometimes, you know, to helicopter up to that elevated view and look at it and yeah. see what a big thing this is in the world. <laughs> and, I just, yeah, and, you I know, Paul, Paul, what, Paul was here doing it with us. He was working folding gowns with Beowulf Borat and he had the foresight to go, you know what, we should capture this. So, you know, we were, I was like, okay, sure, bring, <laughs> bring cameras, whatever you want. And so I didn't even really even think about it because we were just, you know, on a mission, but Paul had the foresight to, to go, this needs to, I guess a filmmaker would, they, he just knew that it needed to be captured. So I'm really thrilled. Uh, I, thought, I thought they did a beautiful tribute to everybody that was involved. And in fact, it, in some ways, when that, when I got the sneak preview of it a couple of weeks before everybody else saw it, I cried and cried and cried because there were people in in the video that I have never met to this day. There were, I, I never went on the road and saw the people that picked it up. I know their names. I know exactly how many bags they took each week, but I have never seen their face. And so I got so emotional watching, you know, there's a sequence where you see them taking off their mask. And so here's me, you know, seeing their name, knowing them, knowing them but not ever seeing them and to see them take off their mask. I was just a mess on the floor <laughs> watching it. So I think it's a beautiful tribute to what everybody did. I mean, I'm honored to have been a part of it in any way, but the fact is it would not have been anything unless everybody surrounded it with the support that we really, really needed. And they definitely did in a big way. And I think the film really captures that. Well, Jeff, thank you. Thank you for tonight. And thank you for all that you've done. And thank you for your gratitude, readiness, openness, and willingness <laughs> to uh, really lead us in what we are capable of, you know, and, and uh, bringing us forward in a way that is just beyond thrilling. Um, it's just, it, it's just, there are moments like this. We all are, we all love being a part of this community, even when it's like, oh, that actor got the role and I didn't get it and all those <laughs> things that happen amongst ourselves, you know, like family. But then there are moments where our awareness of what a gift it is to be a part of this community is, is suddenly in a moment so heightened and we realize what we're capable of and what, um, you know, we're creative people. And I always go back to the Course in Miracles. There's a, a line in there that says something like, um, uh, to, to think like, uh, to think like, I'm gonna mess it up here, but something like, to think like God is to um, understand love, to create like him is to share the perfect love he, he shares with you something like that. And, mm -hmm. um, and I just feel like as creative people, we, um, we are sometimes in moments of heightened community where we understand what we're all capable of together and what a beautiful thing that is to be a part of. So um, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for the work you've done. Thank you for the work you continue to do. Thank you for being truly a Broadway hero and a hero in every sense of the word. And thank you um, uh, for uh, uh, the documentary and um, uh, bringing that forward and, and saying, yes, there's that yes energy again. You know, when Paul <laughs> said, can I make a film of this? Not going, we are so crazy here. Do not bring a film crew in. How would we do that? You know, but saying, 
sure. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. that's the energy. So thank you for all of that. I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. I um, uh, I also want to let you know our next talk coming up is going to be on Friday evening, April 2nd at 7 p.m. And we are going to be talking to Asian American actresses, uh, women of the theater who are uh, Asian American and who are dealing with a lot right now as we are all sensitive to and aware of. And um, and on this premise that theater people are wonderful, I thought it would be really great to talk to some of our uh, theater luminaries about what they have to say. So uh, Ali Ewalt will be joining us and uh, Lainey Sakakora, Pearl Sun, uh, Diane DeVorphalen. And um, I, I hope you'll join us for that because uh, these are incredibly talented, really wonderful people in our community. And uh, I think we've got some stuff to talk about there. So uh, thank you for being a part of Grateful, Ready, Open, Willing. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, everyone who attended. And uh, I wish you a fabulous, uh, wonderful, good evening and everything from here. Thank you. Lindsay, am I clicking and broadcast here or are you doing it there? <laughs>